Welcome to the Desire to Trade podcast, the podcast helping you develop forex trading skills for more freedom. I'm your host, Ethan Kreit. We are in episode 128. Let's get started right away. As you guys might have seen, there's been no episode of the podcast last week. That's mainly because of the travel I've been doing these past few weeks, and it's tough sometimes to get back to it. I've not been traveling for the past six months, and now I'm back traveling once again in Asia. We're getting back to it slowly, and this is the first podcast to hear record on the road from Siem Reap in Cambodia. Cool place, really hot though, you have to be careful with that, but looking forward to explore and visit some more places in the coming weeks. For this episode, I've had the chance to connect with two amazing guys, Brandon and Tom. They are behind Two Blocks Trading and the Two Blocks Trading podcast. Brandon is a quite experienced trader who's been through a lot of different markets and has been able to experiment with a few different, who could say, job in the trading industry. Tom, for his part, started the podcast to become a better trader and has made it his mission to interview traders in order to pass on the knowledge and to be able to understand how trading worked and how he could succeed in trading. This is recorded as a double interview, which means I interview both Brandon and Tom at the same time. And I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Those guys collaborate really well together, and that's why I thought bringing them together would be really cool. So without further ado, please help me welcome Tom Constable and Brandon Turner. All right, sitting down today with Brandon and Tom from Two Blocks Trading. What's up, guys? How are you doing today? How, what's, what's up? On, yeah. Man? Everything's fabulous. <laughs> well, at the same time, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the challenges of doing a podcast with three people. Right. This is the second podcast I think I record with two people, which is going to be kind of interesting, kind of a challenge as well. Well, first of all, my first question I ask my guests most of the time is, what is one quote that inspires you? So we'll start maybe with uh, Brandon. You have a quote in mind that inspires you? God, I've, there's so many quotes that have come across my brain over the 11 years I've seen the markets. I don't know who said this or where it came from, but for me, the one thing that inspires me is your account valuation right now has no determination on your future earnings potential. So just because you have a small account now has nothing to do with what you can earn in the future. I guess that's one that kind of keeps me going. That's quite original. I never heard that before, so I like it. And yeah. I, I can relate to it definitely a lot, so for sure. Love it. Yeah. What about Tom? You have a quote in mind that you've heard or that you would like to share? Well, being a kind of ex-army officer, I, I quite... My quote is quite aggressive. It's pain is just weakness leaving the body. I know it's not specifically <laughs> trading related, right? But when you're going through pain, especially when it comes to learning to trade, with them, there's quite a lot of pain, both financially and, and emotionally. You just got to embrace it. I just know this is accept it as part of the journey and not let it defeat you. Wow, that's heavy. I like that a lot. By the way, I was, I was interviewed on the uh, Two Books Trading podcast last week. And those guys are just real joker all the time. Super funny. So I've been laughing the whole time. <laughs> so I hope you guys will bring that to my podcast a little bit and to entertain people a little bit on whatever topic. So I want to go first into kind of your story and how you started straight exactly. So we'll go with both of you. I want to hear both stories. Let's start with Brandon. How did you come into trading in the first place? Ooh. Hang on, where does, where does he get to go first? I'm not sure. No, I'm joking. No, 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 on, so, sorry, you, you want to go over <laughs> No, you can go ahead. No, no, no. no. Let, let, let the host deal with this now. Sorry. I'm just jumping no. ahead of myself. Yeah. I, I mean, whew, I could go on forever about this. I'll try to keep it as short as possible, but I was, uh, I was introduced to a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I think in 1998. I mean, a lot of people have probably heard of Robert Kiyosaki's stuff. And since that moment, uh, he kind of told me that I could get rich. I could make a lot of money. I could do all these things that I wanted to do and do it on my own terms. So I, of course, went out and after that, I just went on a complete tear. I bought every single course I could find. First, I started in real estate. And I, oh God, I spent tens of thousands of dollars and as an 18-year-old because banks don't seem to have, well, back in 1998, they didn't seem to have a problem with giving you a credit card with an unlimited amount of money on it. So I was, uh, I just beat that up pretty bad because I, I knew I was, once I bought this course, I was going to get the information and I was going to become successful and I would just pay it all back. So I did that for about, oh, eight years <laughs> with absolutely no success whatsoever. Because I'm a glutton for punishment, I kept going with it. And then I answered an ad in, I moved out west. That's one of the things us Canadians do. We'd move out west to go find ourselves because I was working in a factory where I grew up in the city of Windsor. It was just not a motor factory. And um, I just kind of got sick of that, doing that sort of life because as you'd imagine, it's not the best lifestyle to have. So I moved out West and answered an advert, want to make 300,000 this year's trading stocks. 
yep, I do. And then I <laughs> answered that ad and from I got an interview and I once I went into this, it turned out it was a prop firm and this was in Calgary and, and uh, the fellow who was interviewing me, it turned out that I knew way more about trading than he did and I'd never actually made a trade in my life. So he hired me on the spot. Uh, but that's only because I think I read 300 books about trading beforehand. It's one thing, I, I'm a voracious reader and educate myself all the time. And then from there, it was, yeah, he sat me down in my desk first day, said, that's the buy button, that's the sell button. If you lose 50 bucks, you're fired. So I learned very quickly to not lose money. <laughs> getting in and out, I was the king of getting in and out break even. And then I just eventually got that into, very quickly got that into um, profitability and then did that for about five years. And then the next leg of the story, and that was trading equities. Nice. And then the next leg of my story was, I got involved with a startup Forex firm here in uh, Toronto, where I live now. And it was a boutique firm that only catered to uh, really wealthy people. Just based on the regulation we had, we couldn't deal with retail clients. They had to be what we call accredited investors. We had about 200 active multi-million dollar accounts trading every day. And it was unbelievable. Like I had never seen destruction of wealth like that in my life. We didn't have a single client. And this brokerage firm no longer exists. So I'm comfortable saying this, but we didn't have a single client who was in profit um, when they closed out their accounts. Not a single one. Some of them would go on tears and they'd make some money and then they'd give it all back and then some. But I was kind of brought on as like this, you know, former prop trader who knew all about the market so that these high level clients, these wealthy clients knew that they were talking to someone who knew what he was talking about because I'd been in the trenches and I could speak intelligently about the markets with them. And so I learned all about their systems. And they, they had like the craziest systems. Like I'd never heard of technical analysis up to that point in my life because I was a high frequency trader, like a statistical arbitrage trader as a prop trader. And I just learned how these guys lost money. And it was all technical concepts. Like Ichimoku stuff was, for whatever reason, was really good. A lot of these guys, all they really did was they just went long and they went short Euro USD at the same time and just booked the profit and held the loss until hopefully they could book that loss as a profit, which usually never happened. And so they just wound up trashing their accounts. So there, there was no money management to anything. So I said to myself, okay, cool. I'm going to figure out how to trade opposite these guys, which I did by using the brokerage data for a little while, which probably wasn't the most ethical thing to do. But it uh, actually is why I wound up leaving. And I finally figured out for myself that the opposite of what they were doing was trading fundamentals and sentiment. And so that's the long version of how I got to be a sentiment trader. And for me, sentiment trading is I trade the mood of the market today. And I use, I sprinkle a little bit of technicals in there just to, for price levels and stuff like that to get in. So that is the long, long winded story of my, of where I came from and how I got to be where I am today. Mm -hmm. And I know you have a very, very interesting trading style, which is different than I think probably all my guests on the podcast so far. So we'll dive into that a little bit later, but I want to hear about Tom. Tom is at the, kind of a different point in your story as well. And you, you've done some big things in the past as well. But tell people kind of how you started into trading as well. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, before I go into that, let me just say that Brandon missed out the, the biggest step of his career to date, which is moving into being a co-host on the Two Blokes Trading podcast. Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Yeah, I've learned so much from you, Tom. Of course you have. I know you, I know you have. Who wouldn't? But uh, <laughs> my journey is not quite as actually exciting as... Brandon's and certainly not as lucrative, I don't think so far, at least. I left the military and didn't know what career I wanted to get into. I actually qualified as a computer science teacher and quickly realized, regardless of the fact that I've got massive respect for teachers, teachers were um, or are overworked and underpaid, in my opinion. <laughs> and it wasn't quite the career that I wanted to get into just yet. My philosophy was, if I'm going to work that hard, then I want to work that hard for myself to build up some wealth. And then I can then have the time and the money in the bank to then maybe get him back into teaching because I enjoy it or whatever. So then I was looking around for what careers made loads of money. And I had the retail traders perspective of people in the city trading for a living and making millions of pounds. And so maybe a bit arrogant, maybe a bit of a challenge. I like giving myself challenges, but I said, well, what makes them better than me? And gave myself the challenge to see whether or not I could learn and to become profitable. I quickly looked around the internet, did some due diligence and research and realized that there is a massive proportion of the retail trading space that's purely there to part you from your cash and with no interest of actually turning you into a profitable trader. And because I didn't know anyone else that traded and because I didn't know what websites that had quality information on it that I could trust, my good friend at the time, Owen and myself, decided to launch twoblokestrading.com website and podcast just to transparently document our journey from day one, where in the, I think the first 
three episodes, we decided that binary options training was a really good way of making loads of money through to now episode, I don't know, 86, 87 that we're on now, where you know, we've done since then quite a number of podcasts about the binary option scams that are on the market and just purely there to show people our journey and hopefully for people to trust us and prove that eventually you can become a profitable trader. Yeah, I love it. Love it. And one thing I did a bit about that recently about the fact like how my podcast helped me to become much of a profitable trader and grow much faster. And I think you've probably seen the same thing. So maybe can you tell people like what's the difference between you when you started the podcast compared to you today? Can, can you spot a difference or is it hard to find? Hard to no, spot? A huge difference. And we, all three of us, are in a privileged position where we can spend, legitimately spend you know, your days speaking to the world's best and brightest and most profitable traders and not just interview them on, on air, but then also off air. So maybe some, some conversations they may not want to have. And in terms of the way that I've progressed in my, I think, personally think that I know more about the broking industry and the way that brokers operate, how they make money and the good ones versus a bad one. And just more detailed depth about how the industry operates that retail traders wouldn't grasp. And that really does help inform making the right decisions with where you trade. And the biggest thing that I've learned, I'm sure that's, you're going to go into a little bit later on, is the importance of confidence. And every step of the way, you've got to have confidence in your system, but also in the brokerage that you're using that you believe that they also want you to be profitable. And all that stuff then adds up to allowing you to hopefully eventually become profitable. Yeah, confidence is a big topic for sure. For sure. So I want to go to Brendan. And Brendan, I want you to tell people a little bit about your trading style and what you're doing exactly. Very different than what we're used to. So go ahead and maybe if you have a trade example you want to guide people through that they can kind of understand the thought process could be good. Or just explain whatever you want to explain about your process. Yeah, sure. So like I said before, I, I found just that from being on the brokerage side of things that so many traders were using technical analysis and they weren't successful with it. Now I've come to realize, backing up a little bit here, going back to this whole journey Tom has on the podcast and now me with him as well. The one thing I'm learning is that there are very successful technical analysis traders out there. And I was very, very staunch in my opinion that technicals basically are just a road to losses when I first started talking on the podcast. But then like talking to these people and how confident they were and then actually seeing results and also talking to you as well on the podcast, which is going out today. But I've learned that technicals are an important part of trading. So I think what it all boiled down to with the clients that we had is that I think it was more of an emotional issue, like psychology was kind of their enemy at the time, more than their trading strategy, because I've come to find out you really can have a simple technical analysis strategy as long as you execute it right. And I don't think a lot of people execute it according to their plan. They just come in there and they throw their own issues at it and it just doesn't work. So for me, I've actually started to incorporate a little bit more technicals because I miss a lot. But my trading style currently at the moment is it's fundamentals and sentiment. And what I mean by fundamentals is I track central banks. And it may sound difficult, but it's not. The central banks do this thing called forward guidance, which is basically them telling you what they're happy with and what indicators they're watching. So all central banks want to know about jobs, job creation and inflation. So I just want to know what the Federal Reserve of the United States is thinking. And then on the big term picture, so they're raising interest rates. They're concerned with jobs data. So all I want to know is when are they going to raise interest rates and what's the job data looking like? And then what I do is I go down to, the, to today and I have that big picture fundamentals in my mind. But then I look at, okay, I go to my news feed and I use Rand Squawk. This isn't a plug. It's a premium paid news, news service that I have British guys squawking off of my ear all day long about potential market moving news. But they also do morning recaps about what's going on. So I have like a five minute read and I understand everything that fundamentally or sentiment that has happened in the market. And I just take that information. I, then I pull up the currencies. Second, I actually don't even look at my charts. I go to my news feed to figure out what is actually moving. So if today the euro is moving, there's nothing moving today in my opinion. But hypothetically, if the euro was moving today because of some economic data, then I would just go right to the euro dollar and just check out and see if there's any technical levels I get in off of. So I'm looking to trade that sentiment of the day, but a lot of my trading opportunities that come up, come up off the newsfeed itself. So they'll squawk, oh, central bank member Nowotny from the ECB has said something very hawkish, which is very bullish for their currency. And all of a sudden the euro starts to move. So you know how the technical guys tend to stay away from news announcements, but sometimes like the scheduled news announcements, but sometimes stuff comes out that is 
is not scheduled and you can't really predict it, but the market starts moving a lot off the back of it. Like going into the end of last year, to give more specific examples, I guess, the Donald Trump, he made it really easy to make money on certain trades because he would come out and he would just say the most outlandish things. And the market, the one thing the market hates more than anything is uncertainty. And he would just say things that would make the market go, oh, that doesn't sound good. Don't bomb North Korea. Like, what are you doing? And then the first thing that they do, the market will do in that situation is they sell first and they ask questions later. So when that information comes down the news feed, I'm sitting there going, cool. If they sell first and ask questions later, what are they going to move their money into? Because money goes out of one instrument and into another. And traditionally, when people get scared, they buy safe haven instruments, which would be the Japanese yen. So I would just go short dollar yen and Donald Trump would make that really easy for the dollar yen to just plummet because that means that if, if dollar yen is plummeting, that means the yen is actually going up. So it's a safe haven flow. So I don't know if I answered your question there as more of a yeah, yeah. data dump than, than no, anything. Yeah, but. Totally. I, I totally get the principle. So basically you're looking for the alignment between the fundamental and the technical because you won't trade only fundamentals and trade only technicals. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. And I'm starting to incorporate more technicals because when there's not news that's coming down you know, randomly throughout the day, there's so many trades that I see happen that I'm, I'm missing. And my goal for 2018 is to take more trades and try to make a higher percentage profitability on the year. So in order to do that, I need to start incorporating a bit of technicals. I need to start looking at you know, support and resistance bounces and things like that. Just not overly complicated stuff. Like I'm not getting into Ichimoku clouds and floating above oscillator things. I still don't know the terms, but just simple stuff. So I can try to get into some more trades, but they're always, the one thing that's most important for me is that if I do take a technical setup, it 100% has to be in alignment with either the, the big picture fundamental, and in which case that would be more of a longer term trade, like one or two days for me, or it has to be in line with the sentiment that's happening right now in the market. Like, for example, Brexit is still on the market's mind, which is kind of controlling the flow of the pound. So if there's some really positive news about Brexit negotiations or whatever, if there's like really good news for the, the British pound, and we have, so that's the sentiment today, and there's a technical alignment with that, so there's a support bounce or there's a breakout or whatever it is that you want to call it, that to me is a super juicy trade that I need to get all over. Love it. And so this is something I've been hearing a lot of times about, like the fact of the technical fundamentals. But I never quite got into fundamentals, basically because it's really hard to test your methodology. So how have you validated your edge? And for people who wonder about fundamentals, how have you been able to test whether that was working better than just technicals? Yeah. So for me, I knew that fundamentals were going to be a big part of my picture because I watched so many of these ultra successful people lose money at the brokerage firm with my time there. So I just knew I wanted to do the opposite of them. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of information about fundamentals. And I don't have a good answer for your audience at all because it involves time and sitting in front of the screens and listening and watching. Like, for example, I always tell people that you have no idea what a safe haven flow feels like until you've been run over by a safe haven flow. And my example of when I finally understood what safe haven flows meant, and basically that's just when the market goes risk off and they're really scared about something. So like nuclear war with North Korea or what else would cause safe haven flow, a war breaking out, like that kind of stuff. Just the market gets scared. The first time I finally, finally clicked for me is I was trading the pound yen and I see the pound and just like a lot of people, I'm sure they look at it and they're like, the pound yen has fallen 200 pips in the last 10 minutes. There's no way it's going to go down anymore. So I'm going to buy it. And then two minutes later, it's down 400 pips. Like this is no, come on, this is crazy. I'm going to buy some more. And it's down 600 pips over like an hour period. It's down 600 pips. And I was like, there's no way max BP we're in this. And you come to find out that you get stopped out, the broker <laughs> closes your position, and now you understand the power of, of a, uh, a safe haven flow. I kind of got off on a tangent there. What was the original question? Yeah, so how do you validate your edge when you use fundamentals? Because I guess right. it's hard to go back in time and look at all the data, all the news that day. Yeah, so for me, like, you just have to understand that there's a few things that control the Forex market. I'm a Forex trader, so I should make that clear. Mm -hmm. There's a few things that control the Forex market central bankers and interest rates, and they're kind of one and the same. So like, there are times when you know, a stock market will be able to control the flow of Forex, but for the most part, it is all about the fundamentals that's moving price. So I know that if I understand what the central bank of each country is doing, and they're active in 
in the market, because if they're concerned about jobs data, then I know that I'm going to be wanting to watch jobs data. And so it took a long time of just sitting there, I'd say about six months of just sitting there and watching, for example, non-farm payrolls come out. Because the interesting thing about, about economic data is, and if someone doesn't know what non-farm payrolls is, it's just the jobs data in the United States, is that it could come out 200,000 jobs created. And say the market expected 200,000 jobs created, and it comes out 200,000 jobs just like it is, the market could go straight up. But next month, the market's expecting 200,000 jobs again, and it comes out 200,000, and then it goes down. The US dollar goes down. And it's really interesting because that's why from watching economic data, that's when I learned that like, it's not about just a specific number. It's all about the market expectation of what that specific number should be. Mm -hmm. And so if market's expecting one thing and you get something different, like for example, you get something, the market's expecting really positive, but you get really negative, then that's going to cause the market, the US dollar to get crushed. And so, but you could get the same number, like you could get that 200,000 number every single time and you get totally different reactions in the market because of what the expectation was from the market. So the expectations of what the market expects is as important, if not more important than what the actual number is. Because if everything comes out in line as with the expectations, you don't get as much of a price move. It's when things deviate from market expectations that causes the big moves. And so I know it's not a great answer for your listeners, but it really was just time spent like with the market, watching the news come out and seeing how the market reacted. And then once you have that experience, it's part of your brain and it's part of your makeup. So we make all of our decisions based on past information and past experiences. Like, you know, to run away from lions because you've seen videos of lions eating people or whatever it is, like you don't want to do something that's dangerous. And so all this information gathering that I got helps keep me out of dangerous situations, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And this is a valid way to test your methodology as well. You don't have to necessarily back test to test something. Could be you, you forward test it and you look at the chart, which is, it definitely take, takes more time and more effort. But if you're willing to spend the time to do it, then that, that's totally valid, I think. Yeah. And I think one of the most important things that helped me was that once I saw the reaction in the market, I took a screenshot. Um, once the whole uh, trade played out, I took a screenshot and then I wrote about it. I wrote about, this is what the market was expecting. This is what happened. That was the reaction that happened on the chart. And so then I can go back and look at these things. Okay, so non-farm payrolls is coming out. I can go back and look at the last six times that non-farm payrolls came out and see exactly what I was thinking about the fundamentals and sentiment at that time and the actual numbers that came out. Like you can go get the actual numbers from like Forex Factory Calendar if you want. But like for me, I'm actually seeing what the expectation was because it's really, it's hard to be able to remember like data three months ago that came out. Non-farm, I have no idea what, how, what non-farm payrolls came out three months from now. I have no idea what the market was feeling or experiencing at that day. But if I go back and look at my journal, I can tell you what that was. And so I think that's super, super important. This is one of the things like on the Two Blokes Trading podcast that we've been talking to a lot of people recently, and yourself included, that just highlight the importance of journaling and tracking your trades and then looking at the results and then trying to improve upon them. So pretty important stuff. Yeah. And I'm almost sure that if you didn't do this at that time, if you didn't track everything, you would not have been as successful today for sure. Because you wouldn't be able to find patterns and stuff. And yeah, you would be 100%. kind of guessing and expecting something. And yeah, the yeah, answer. So that, that's a big habit. You still do the same thing today? Kind of tracking all your trades and all the setups? Yeah. I made a switch from my horrible, as Tom will tell you, and I, I know I'm dominating the podcast here, but... um. Tom yeah. will tell you, I, I am not the best with technology. <laughs> I'm, I've, I've tried several times to get on the internet to show my, I don't even have a website or anything like that. I'm just hanging out with Tom on two blokes, but I had this terrible Excel sheet that I didn't even know what I was doing on it. I'm just like taking pictures and I'm referring to like another folder where I'm keeping my pictures. And like, if I want to look at this Euro USD trade, I have to go into another folder and just check. It just was awful. So I just made the switch to edge bonk to use their journal. I know you're, you know, more it's yeah. and Rolf, it's good guys. Good lads. I've just started using theirs the, the beginning of this year and it's really useful. Like there's good, useful stuff and it's helping me track my trades in a more organized fashion because as Tom will have will have you know, I am pretty bad at organization. You make it sound like I'm always negative about you, Brandon. I, I think you've <laughs> you sound semi intellectual on this podcast so far. It's pretty good. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Compliments. I never expected that one to come by. Thanks, <laughs> yeah, Tom. Cool. Yeah. So let's move to Tom. And Tom, I want to hear about your, your training style as well. And more specifically, did that kind of evolve over time since you started the podcast? Or did you always, were you always clear on what you were going to trade? No, it certainly wasn't clear. And people that will, if they start from, there are some people who are dedicated enough to start from episode 000 and work their way through, which um, hats off to every single one of you. Go and get a job. Well, what I like about it is that the, I, I've looked at everything. So at the start of the podcast, that's when we started speaking to Brandon and interviewing Brandon on, on the podcast. And so we started to learn about the fundamentals of sentiment really early on, which was fascinating and really important and valuable to get an understanding of that, to which I promptly chinned off and, and moved across to technically trading. Because for me personally, knowing myself as I do, I am very logical. I'm black or white. I'm on or off. And that does not lend itself to trading Brandon's system. You have to be very comfortable with ambiguity. And it's just not really the way that I operate. So I fairly early on identified that trading technically would be the direction that I wanted to go. However, for a good chunk of the first few interviews, I didn't know the phrases backtesting. I certainly didn't know how to do it. And trade journaling. And I certainly didn't know how to do it. And I'm caveating all this with that I wouldn't currently describe myself as a profitable trader. At this moment in time, my trades are profitable, but I want people to understand that it takes time before you can define yourself as a profitable trader. It's not yeah. you know, this week I've made a bit of, you know, I'm 5% up, I'm a, I'm a hero, right? It's six to 12 months. And then after those 12 months, you can look back. And if you're happy with where you performed, you've stuck to your trade, trading plan, your system, and it's still profitable. At that stage, you can start to get that warm, fuzzy feeling that maybe you're learning and knowing what you're doing. It's a long-term game. It's not a short-term. And one last thing from my side in terms of the please to your listeners is if you hear you know, myself, Brandon or Etienne going on about backtesting and going on about trade journaling and you're not doing it, I haven't yet spoken to one trader that I believe is profitable that hasn't, a technical trader always uses backtesting, but also the profitable traders who are fundamental and sentiment, they always trade journal. So I haven't yet found anyone that's gone, no, I don't do any of that stuff. I'm just, you know, fly by the seat of my pants and I've got pants and I've got loads of, loads of money. It's like, great, but I've just never seen that. So if you're not doing it yourself, stop what you're doing, stop trading live account and get back and start the basics. Sorry, I'll get off my high horse. And so my current trading uh, style that I'm trying to master is trend trading and it's day trading, trend trading, doing a bit of technical analysis, working out where the levels are and then looking for key movements and off the levels, basically. Cool. Yeah. And this is a very valid point. And for so long, I resisted the idea of doing either backtesting or journaling. And that took me almost two and a half years to start doing. Yeah. And that was way too long. But yeah, it's something that you don't want to do first, but you realize like you have to do. And if you really want to make it to trading, you have to do it. So you just end up doing it. And it's not a problem. And trading isn't for everybody. So if you're the person sitting here listening to that going, yeah. I just don't want to do that, then great, go and find something else to do because it's just, you're not going to become profitable. And you're just wasting money. <laughs> you're gambling. Yeah. And to add on to that point, because I come from the yeah. prop world, I can tell you 100% that when I started out as a prop world and the, trading in the prop world, it was very successful quickly because I was doing a trade journal on every single trade. There was times where I was taking between three and five million shares a day and like a hundred trades and I would still trade journal every single trade but just because I had to. And for whatever reason, that process kept me good. And I can tell you right now, like, I mean, I was a very different style of trading and that doesn't really exist anymore, which is why I've moved on to another, to Forex. But I'll tell you, I, I know a lot of guys at big prop firms and every single one that, that is making, like, we, I know guys who make a million a year, they trade journal relentlessly. Like this one fella, I won't say his name, but he makes seven figures and he was showing me one day his trade tracking and his, his is just, he's not using an actual journal per se. He just writes it all on the chart. So he takes a picture of the chart and he writes everything that happened on the chart. And that's, that's how he trade journals, which is it's a cool way to do it too. But he had thousands and thousands of examples. And like, I had to tell him to stop. I was blacking out. There was so much information happening. Thousands and thousands of examples that he's done every single day he's in for two hours after the market closes, doing that, like doesn't stop. And he's making seven figures, living the dream. It's, it's something to be said for it. Yeah. And I'm not sure if it's, Mike Belafiri who said this, but someone told me once, like he knows how to recognize a good trader by whether that person is willing to come in like Saturday morning to look at all these trades. And if the person is yeah. not willing to do it, then it's probably not a good trader in the future. That's something to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think yeah, it's only totally true. Down in his yeah. books, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. So 
Tom, I'm curious to know one thing I've noticed with some of the guys that I help who are like really, really systematic, like they're, like you said, black and white, and they want to have things very clear. They sometimes have a tough time with like identifying levels and stuff on a chart. Is this something you've kind of struggled with a little bit or was it always easy for you to look at levels and support resistance, stuff like that? Yes, absolutely. It was an absolute killer because for exact, that exact reason, it's almost impossible to find a rule-based way of creating levels. There are yeah. people that have got them and I've, I've spoken to lots of people that do do it, but it, it's so hard to find the system that best suits you. And the way that I managed to get over it, I think, is by letting go a little bit. And instead of creating a specific you know, line on the chart, I've started to create zones which then allow, that gives me a bit more flexibility for where the levels are. Um, still gives me the same indications, but it doesn't have to react exactly off that level. It could just uh, react around that level, and that will still give me the same uh, warm, fuzzy feeling that the trade's moving in the right direction that, that I require. So that's the way that I got over it. But yeah, I, I feel for any newbie traders who, like, who hear people talking about support and resistance levels, sit down, look at the charts, and no two traders will sit down and put the same support and resistance levels on the charts. So you've just got to find a way that works for you, backtest it, and, and keep using it. Exactly, exactly. And what I want to know is, there's a lot of people right now who also, like I've been in that situation as well, where you have a full-time job, let's say you work all day, and you want to work on becoming a better trader. And I'm, I'm sure you went through this also. What exactly have you done to make sure you were becoming better and that you were, I don't know, testing your methodology? Or are there some things that you have to do before getting to the point where you're at right now where you can kind of trade more confidently? Yeah, accountability partner having someone that will just hold you accountable and hold you to your targets and the rules that you want to take. We all, all human nature is we want to cut corners. Human nature is that, you know, I said I was going to test three days worth of back testing, but you know, if I do one day, that's absolutely fine. Whereas if you have a friend or someone within a community that wants to be an accountability partner, that you want to help each other, not teach each other how to be profitable because that's just not, everyone trades differently. So don't expect people to teach you how necessarily if you find an accountability partner for them to help you become profitable but they can hold you to hold your feet across the fire and make sure that you stick to your own rules and that's the thing that made the step change for me that and back testing made the step change from floundering around not knowing what i'm doing to yeah okay cool i've got a direction let's keep doing what i'm doing let's see if i can make this long-term profitable system i think another yeah. thing to jump in there too with tom is since you started your trading journey you've basically started day one doing your podcast as well so you've always had someone there to take the piss out of you on air and ever for everyone to listen to. There's not a bit of an accountability partner there. That's exactly what it's been. It's been at the yeah. start was Owen and then he's moved on to bigger and better things now. And we've got now a two blokes version 2.0 with, with now Brandon, the boss Tanner, who's now, and again, we do hold each other accountable. And with Brandon, I can help regardless of the fact that Brandon's far more experienced than I am. I can still help him stick to his rules as well. So it's a two-way thing that we can you know, help each other out with. And yeah. this is the power of really being surrounded by traders because you can yeah, have them as an accountability partner. What's your first accountability partner, a trader or someone else, someone in another field? Just Owen, my uh, good pal that we started the podcast with. So we were both okay. as wide-eyed and inexperienced as each other. But it, yeah, like it doesn't, honestly, it doesn't really matter as long as you found someone yeah. to hold you accountable. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, I've, I've seen different people either outside of trading or into trading. And yeah, that's the power of being around other traders for sure. And so what are some of the activities you've done kind of to help you become better? So I've, I've, I've gone through uh, a number of different bits of trading education. And I do think there are some very good trading educators out there. Mm -hmm. I won't say any of the ones that I've been on, but they have been extremely helpful just to spend time around people that I truly believe make money trading and learn from them. And frankly, you know, the system I'm currently using now isn't one that they taught me but I still would put down any success that I generate from it because of the coaching and support that I've had through those courses. Because until it's, I'll bring you back to the word confidence. And until you can build that confidence, you see you're confident that people actually do make money in this industry because that's one of the biggest things that stopped me at the start. The more people I spoke to, the less confident I got until I interviewed the, the right people, got to see their, their accounts and actually saw them live trading. And then I built the confidence. Okay, this is going to be worthwhile me, me spending the time learning. Then it's confident in the system I'm being taught and, the, and show, so they then showed me how they got to profitability, e.g. technically backtesting their systems, then demo trading, then live trading, then, then teaching. And so, okay, cool. I'm happy that this is the process I should be going through to become profitable. And the confidence now, that when you go into a live account, you've now got all that confidence behind you. Then that gives you the confidence to make sure you stick to your trading rules, and tra even if it's not making the money until it is profitable. 
Yeah, love it, love it. And the teaching part is really important, like you mentioned. And I've done a lot before I started to teach, but once I got to teach, I learned even more. So, which is interesting. And it gives you again this accountability, which is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Brandon, do you see some common mistake people make in the market? Like as prank traders try to get better and they make mistakes all the time, some common patterns that people do wrong? Yeah, I think it's not even really a pattern. I think one of the biggest problems with especially with retail traders is unrealistic expectations. And what I mean by that is like it's really hard to come and it's not their fault most of the time because like you go online and you see these these chimps on Instagram who are posting, you know, they've made a, a screenshot of what probably is a one of their thousand demo accounts that they just made $1,500 trading, whatever. Because when you're on your mobile, you can't see the difference on an MT4, the difference between a live and a demo account when they show you the screenshot. And so people see this stuff and they think, and then they obviously have something to sell you as well. And people see this stuff and so they think, oh, well, I can do this too. And rightly so to them. Like if, if one person can make $1,500 on a trade, then you should be able to do it too if you have the information that they have. But the problem is, is that I think everybody doesn't give enough credit to putting the time in, like doing the work and actually putting in that time because it's, it's kind of like, like mountain climbing. Like you've got, if you put two guys together, one person's been climbing for 25 years and who's climbed really big peaks and all that kind of jazz. And then some person who just went out and bought a bunch of fancy equipment and it's their first time and they think they're going to get to the top of Mount Everest or something like that. Like it's pretty unrealistic that that person's that new person who's got flashy equipment is going to be able to do it without killing themselves. And so same is true with trading. The unrealistic expectation is just that on one point you can't blame people because that's what they're sold and that's what they're told. But then the other thing, they bring that in there and it's just like, you're not going to make a thousand percent in your first month, regardless of what, you know, the Instagrammers or other people selling you information online tell you. It's just, it's time to reel it back in. Like I always tell people that if you can make between like say two to 5% per month and you do it, that's in a scalable way. Like none of this like scalping stuff where you take two, three pips, but like 30, 40, 50, 60 pip profits, that kind of stuff. That's scalable. Like there are investors that would love to give you a ton of money. If you can show them a track record that says you make an average of 4% per month with a drawdown of 3% whenever you have bad losing streaks. You can literally leverage that up. Like there are people, I, I know one guy who he trades, I think he's got about a hundred million under management and he started off with a $5,000 account, but he just traded that 5,000 bucks like it was gold. Like it was actually really valuable to him and just made two, three, four percent on that. And now he's, he's making, he's raking in the kind of cash that people are told they can rake in. But what they're not being told is that it took him eight years to get there, you yeah. know? So I think that unrealistic expectation and, and just add another point to that too. Those unrealistic expectations are kind of what is another issue that I see a lot of traders have is it kind of forces them to go system hopping or switching. So they go, they find one shiny system, they come Monday morning, they start trading away by sometime by around Wednesday, they realize the system's horrible. They don't know how to make money using and they're just losing money. So the week they go out, have a few pints on Friday. And then by Saturday morning, they're Googling the next shiny system that's out there. And then they come fired up Monday morning with their new system that's guaranteed to make them you know, profitable trader. And they just keep going through that same cycle of switching systems and never really getting anywhere with it. And I think this is also something that we've heard a lot lately on our podcast is that 50 to 100 trades, even 200 trades is like a minimum that are executed exactly as per your system requirements, like no issues. Like 100 trades is a minimum that you can say your system works or it doesn't work. And I, yeah. I just really don't think people get to that at all. Yeah, exactly. And I'm really glad you mentioned this because for a long time, I've also done this, like going back and forth between systems. And I always thought that the goal in trading was to get as much profit as possible, like get the highest dollar amount. And then I switched over time to like, just even if I were to have like an average return, like as much as possible, but that this would be much more profitable over time. And when, yeah. you, when you get to that mindset of like not switching, just sticking to, Something even if it's lower average, you're you're much better than everybody else. Yeah, no doubt. That's another thing too. Like to go back to the point of scalability, just to like add on to these points here. Like if you're trading, let's say a thousand dollar account, and you're leveraging up like a monster. Like say you've got I don't know ten bucks a pip is what you're trading. Like you're only a hundred pips away from ruin. So now let me ask if ask you here like. If you have a $1,000 account and you're taking that $10 pip per risk, and if you lose 100 pips, your account's completely gone, 
If you have a $100,000 account, are you willing to risk the same multiple to make your percentage return? Like, are you on $100,000, are you comfortable with saying in 100 pips, because of the size of my trade, my entire $100,000 could be completely destroyed and gone? Like, it's ridiculous because people don't care about the thousand. I shouldn't say that. It's easier to risk a lot more on that thousand. By the time you get up to 100,000, two, three, four, a million, you're not willing to take those kinds of risks. So your system isn't scalable if you're taking that kind of risk at those lower numbers. Like you can't get up to that $100,000 without destroying your money. And I think a mistake people make sometimes is they think that since they have a low kind of account capital now that they can risk more so that they will be mm -hmm. able to make enough money to have a bigger account and then they're going to have the proper risk management. But those yeah. things are like habits. So when you do it one way for some time, it becomes the same way forever. Yep. And sooner or later, if you do it wrong at the beginning, you're going to be wrong later. Yeah, no doubt. It's just a psychological, it yeah. just destroys you. Like you think uh -huh. you're a trader and you can make money because you've, you've taken all that big risk and you've turned a thousand into 5,000. But you, once you start getting out there, man, it's just going to destroy your psychology and it's, it's just going to take you back to ground zero. It's not improvement. Uh -huh. Have you found a way to kind of readjust your expectations? Because for me, it happened kind of naturally over time. I want to get comfortable with lower expectation of return. For me, it was very difficult to adjust my expectation because I came into the, this proprietary trading world where mm -hmm. it was just different. Like the trading strategies were like, we were just looking for inefficiencies in the marketplace. And then we would just plug them up and hope that we made money. And it was good and bad because it worked that I made a bunch of money, but it was bad in that it was an unlimited amount of money. Like you could just have whatever you want. It was like different times. It was cowboys and Indians. And so for me, trying to readjust like having that infinite amount of money at my disposal and not really knowing my return. I'm sure my return was really, really, really low, like probably like 2% a year. <laughs> but I just yeah. did it on such large trade size that it, it was profitable. But it was difficult for me to readjust because Tom will have you know, I'm a bit of an animal. I, uh, I definitely <laughs> suffer from the same psychological issues that everybody else does. And probably to a larger degree, like I am my biggest proponent and my biggest enemy, like at the same time. I have to no. pep talk him every time we start the podcast. Sometimes he's having a good day and we get happy Brandon on the podcast. And that is a, that is a good day to be alive. But then sometimes you get the dark and angry Brandon who I have to give him a pep. To maybe his trade has gone a bit the wrong way. Even the worst scenario is when we're halfway through a podcast and then a trade hits his stop loss. God, I'll tell you what, we just have to pause recording <laughs> for a bit and come back to it later on. So yeah, Brandon does need a bit of a, the psychology of it. You are, I, would, I would describe you as an expert at it because you have to use it on yourself so often. Yeah. One of the ways that I, um, I've kind of coped with, with it is just I do like martial arts. And so it's a good way for me to vent my issues and frustrations. I think everyone does need some sort of physical outlet. So I actually, in my office, I'm looking at it right now, I've got a big UFC heavy bag hanging from my ceiling that, uh, you know, if I've had a bad trade, I may throw on my, uh, my mittens and punch it up a bit or or I may just go bare knuckles until I bleed and punch it a bit, but it's a, it's a good stress relief. <laughs> Get to refocus because you just go crazy. And then you realize that you, like if anyone saw you right now, they would think you need to be institutionalized. And, and then you just, okay, cool. I'm a little bit sweaty now. I'm out of breath and I'm okay to get back to this. Done. Brandon also is, is the reason why he is trading by himself at the moment is he's, he's just not employable. <laughs> Fact. He's just got issues, <laughs> <laughs> which is well, like, hard. a very good point. It's, it's, it's a very good thing to have, very good quality to have, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go, Brandon. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you get to develop yourself more. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 No doubt. Good with it. So I know last time I was in your podcast, we discussed about habits. And one thing I mentioned was meditation. I know you guys are not big meditators and you don't like to meditate, but do you have any habits that are kind of you would say are responsible for your success or your, your growth that you would like to share with people? Yeah, well, dogged determination to succeed, I think, is, is key. Uh, you have to be passionate about it, uh, about trading and about becoming successful. Again, if you look at yourself in the mirror and you just don't see that passion and it's just more of a chore than an enjoyment, then just, cool, not a problem. Stop spending money on trading, go and do something else. So I'd say make sure you've got the passion and fitness. And it's something that I have... Since I have an excuse as to why I have in the last two weeks, I've not done any fizz. It's completely ridiculous. Completely. You know, excuse me. Am I allowed to swear? <laughs> yeah, sure. sure. Well, I'm sorry. I'm saying it's, it's complete bullshit. I definitely could be going out and doing more runs. And it's something that I pride myself upon fitness. The fitter I am tends to be the more focused I am. 
the more more likely I am to stick to my rules because I've already stuck to my life rules, i.e. go for one bit of fitness every single day. So they're the two things for me, dogged determination to succeed and make sure you stick to, stick to your day-to-day rules and then you're more likely to stick to your uh, trading rules. Absolutely. That, that's the big one. And Brendan, anything to add to that? No, I mean, I really second on Tom's comment about passion. The only thing I would add to that is that if you're not passionate about trading, if you, like, if you can't get to that point where you are passionate, I really think you do need to go try something else. And not just because, I think it's just because you deserve it. Like we all deserve <laughs> to be happy in life. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that if trading is just a source where it makes you very unhappy and you're not passionate about it, you should definitely go find something else that will. It's the thing about the internet is that you can make your living or you can substitute your income or whatever it is in so many different ways. Like there's mm-hmm. lifestyle things you can do. Like there's so many different ways you can do it. You just have to figure it out which goes to my next thing is just do the work, like do the work. Like, I don't know what else to say. Just do the work. That's the one thing that I will say, like when I first started trading and I, I'm not as good at this now, I'm a bit more lazy I'm a little bit older, a little bit fatter and a little, a little bit less determined and kind of stuck in my ways. But in the beginning, like my boss and my second week had to make me my own key to the office because I was sitting outside the doors waiting for him to come so I could get in there and start doing it. And so I I actually was, once he gave me my own keys to the office, I was the first guy in. I was there probably two hours before everybody else. And I was, I left probably three hours after everybody else. And it was just doing the work, reviewing the trades, like finding new information, looking at the data to see if there, is there another arbitrage opportunity within this data that we have and just running over it, like ignoring my fiance at the time and just doing the absolute work that you need to do. And for me, that's why I went from zero, never having a negative month in my prop trading career to like right off the start, like even my first month of trading was profitable because I just, I learned how to get in and out, break even really, really fast, but it was just doing the work. It was a big, huge part of that. that. And some people might or might not agree on this. I'm, I'm totally on that. The fact that it's also good to have other things you do outside trading, like either what is going to be podcasting or doing videos or whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. Because like things are not always going to be super good in trading or super like nice. And you want to be able to uh, do something else you love at the same time. So I don't yeah. know, for, for me, it's, it's the case. I, I want to do other things in trading at the same time. But some people might say you have to focus on trading or I don't know. I, I don't believe that. But I think you guys understood I, that you have to do other things than only trading. Absolutely. And, and I will say that from the you know, little experience I've had now, a year and a half into this now, good trading from a technical perspective is boring trading. So, <laughs> and, and you've got to, if it is boring, you're doing things right. But also that means there is going to be a lot of time where you don't have a lot to do. And you know, you'll end up, if you're not prepared for that, you don't have other things to do with your time, with your life, you'll end, end up either over trading or over complicating it and then never becoming profitable. If you have other things that you can focus on, then you'll just sit there waiting for the trade setup. You know that works. As soon as you see it, you execute your trade, you become profitable and you, know, you can impress the guys down the pub at how great you are at trading. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. So how can people find you if they want to connect with you or reach out or see your podcast? So best place is go to tubloketrading.com and the uh, podcast is right on there. You've got all the podcast apps. You can just listen to wherever you're listening on this. Just search for Two Blokes Trading. You should be able to find us there. Any questions uh, or comments, queries, ping an email to blokes at tubloketrading.com. And we've also, one last thing, on Twitter as well, at tubloketrade, trade with an E at the end because Twitter won't allow us to have trading. So trade. And I know you have a webinar coming up pretty soon. I think podcast is going to be published on time. So you want to plug it in? Yeah, no, very kind of you. Appreciate it. So we mentioned how important trade journaling is. And it's not just something we're saying. It, it really is fundamental if you are serious about trading. We've got good pals called Rolf and Moritz who uh, work over at edgewonk.com who they've released their independent trading journal, which is epic. And they're going to take us through a webinar, take us through why it's so important, how to use it, Firstly, to identify your edge, but secondly, how to improve your trading edge. So definitely worth going to. It's on the 7th of February, which is a Wednesday, 7 p.m. British time, so GMT, UK time. And go to tubloketrading.com forward slash edgewonk webinar and sign up there. Hope to see you there, guys. I know it's going to be awesome. We'll put a link in the show notes for sure as well. We can check it out. You're a gentleman. Awesome. And cool. So what kind of goal do you guys have for the future? Uh, Brandon, would you like to go first? Ooh, yeah, just my 2018 is, Tom kind of put me onto this, so I'll give him the credit for it, is to to just be more flexible in my approach. 
Like I know what I know and I know what works for me, but I need to be more flexible because I'm recognizing that there are a lot of opportunities that I'm risking or that I'm missing. And for me, part of my risk management plan is to take every opportunity that presents itself. And if I'm not doing that, I'm violating my own risk management, which is a cardinal sin. So it's just to be more flexible, to try to understand more about the markets. Like I'm getting a bit more on this technical train that everyone does. And, but not only that, to open myself up to more opportunities rather than just reading a book, you know, once a month and not really taking anything away from it. I talk to more people. I'm going to do the, the thing you do, Etienne, and surround myself with more traders, which is not something yeah. I've done because I sit in my basement office and beat up my punching bag whenever that happens. But I think it's probably healthy just to go talk to more people. And if I can find one thing that helps me make 1% a month more, that means a lot to my bottom line. Right. So I'm just totally being flexible 2018 and doing the work. I love that. Cool. Tom, anything, any goal you have for this year or it could be five years, it doesn't matter. Yeah, two things really. Echoing what Brandon said about being open-minded, the whole crypto thing pretty much passed me by because I was a bit too arrogant saying like, you know, it's blatantly a bubble, it's not going to work. Now, don't get me wrong, it is a bubble. <laughs> you know, everyone knows that, everyone acknowledges it. But the skill about being open-minded about it is you will research each individual opportunity and identify the opportunities within that. And, and there was so much money that could be made and broken within that sector. Is now, by the way, that trade call that I made before we started recording that has dropped $1,000, just by the way, guys, just put it out there. <laughs> a little pat on your own back there. <laughs> yeah, that, thanks. So that was one of them, be more open-minded, but also getting into the algorithm and EA development space. Uh, I want it, that's something, once I've kind of, bit more knowledge up. I, I've got a good pal of mine who's an amazing developer and him and I are working on developing different trading systems using EAs. And that's a really big goal for me because I want to prove that you can tr trade technically uh, and robotically and profit from the markets. Yeah, cool. I can relate to that as well a lot. So I like it. Cool. So I have a question I ask my guests at the end of every podcast and I'll ask you both a different sentence if possible. If you could give only one sentence of advice for traders on how they can try, what would that one sentence of advice be? Let's start with Brendan. Jeez. Um, wow. There's, that's so hard because there's so much. Like, right. how, do you, how do you choose which one to do? I mean, we've talked about a lot of them right now. I might just be, um, throughout this entire podcast, we've talked about those subjects should, should be those one sentence. So I'm, I'm making this more than one sentence. And I apologize. I've broken your, <laughs> your rules here. Right in your um, sacks. Yeah, <laughs> I think I, I would just go back to my one of the things we spoke about earlier in the podcast, which is the amount of money you have right now in your trading account in no way, shape or form has anything to do with your future's earning potential. And if you can just keep your eye on that, uh, you will get to a point where you are achieving your goals financially. I think that's just about it. I think that's really important. Cool. And Tom, what would your sentence be? Your one sentence? I'm sure I'll listen to everything there. Brandon says. <laughs> and be humble and listen to advice from trusted sources and i'll give you one more elaboration on that so again i'm breaking the rule but everyone i've spoken to says backtest and use a journal so if you're listening to this and you're not doing that and you're not profitable right now then please be humble enough to take that on board and, and action it boom love that love that brendan and tom thanks so much for being on the podcast it's been a pleasure to be here today thanks so much for having us uh, it's been great fun thank you that was it for my interview with Brandon and Tom. I hope you guys liked it. And definitely check out their two blogs trading podcast. Highly recommend. The cool thing is that you can see the progression, especially from Tom since the beginning to today. And he's been through a lot of different phases, which is really interesting to see. And you might be able even to recognize yourself through all these phases. I want to remind you that while traveling, I'm really active on YouTube. So check out the YouTube channel over at desartotrade.com forward slash video. I'm trying to keep up the schedule of one video per day. It could be about travel or trading or whatever else. And so far, people love it. So make sure you don't miss out. That being said, I'll catch you guys next week for the next episode of the Desire to Trade podcast. Ciao.